Greetings one and all, Saturday night live here in the Holy Land, the Holy City of Elon More. This time not in my house, in one of the beautiful synagogues in Elon More. We are on the 16th day of the first month of Adar, 5784. Yes, we could just call it SNL, Saturday Night Live. Okay, once again, this class, as we always say, this class is for the sake of heaven to, pr to improve ourselves one small step for mankind, uh, but a big step for us. And we always want to thank our sponsor, our channel, Mike, doing great things in the southern Israel protecting the Jewish people, and also to the one and only blog, Tomer Devora. Check it out. Okay, we are on the second part of Gaza, the day after Israel's greatest imminent threat. We must ask ourselves a question, disregarding the point whether... We, we understand that Israel made a mistake. The 11 tribes made a mistake when it came to not uh, eradicating the idol worshiping that was happening right under their nose, three kilometers away from the tabernacle in Shiloh. But disregarding that for a minute, our sages, our authorities, what do they have to say? How do they look at this battle that took place between Israel and the tribe of Benjamin? Do they look at it negatively? This is a civil war. It is, uh, it is negative. It is derogatory. It is a, uh, it is a holocaust. Or is it looked at positive that Jews got up and fought to eradicate evil? So let's take it from the top. Number one, according to our source of Tana Yau, chapter 11. After the event of what happened to this poor woman in the hilltop of Benjamin, God wanted to destroy the world. So the fact that God did not destroy the world, what stopped God from destroying the world? It's very, very clear that this battle against evil stopped God's desire, so to speak, to destroy the world. Second source, we see that it's a positive. The, our sages look at it in a positive light. Esther Rabbah, 7, 11, chapter 7, paragraph 11. This is a day of merit for the Jewish people. This is a, this is a month where Haman wanted to, was deliberating to, de, to annihilate the Jewish people. In the month of Shvat, he decided that there was no way to be victorious over the Jewish people since they had this merit, merit of going out and fighting against the evil perpetrated by the tribe of Benjamin. Number three, source number three, this is in Breshit Rabbah 6516. Based on the verse, the voice is the voice of Jacob, the hands are the hands of Esau. This is, uh, of course, talking about when Jacob dressed up as his brother to try to receive the blessings of his father Isaac. The, uh, the great commentator, the... Tiferet Sion, Rabbi Yitzchak Yadler. Uh, he lived from 1843 to 1917. He had an 18-volume commentary on the various Midrash Rabbah work. <clears throat> and listen to his an amazing explanation of this verse. He writes the following. What in addition to what happened with Isaac and Jacob and Esau that we give. But the Torah is eternal. 
and the lessons are eternal, not just for that local event that happened between a dispute between Jacob and Asaph, who's going to get the blessing. So the, the, um, the Breshik Rabbah tells us that this verse is talking about also um, is talking about in addition to what happened with Isaac and Jacob, it's also talking about what happened during the time of uh, Benjamin and this couple that um, were attacked by the community of Benjamin. So the voice was the voice of Jacob. That was the Jewish people accept, accepting upon themselves a vow not to marry women from Benjamin. <clears throat> they were worried about negative influences from this tribe. If this tribe was able to perpetrate such, uh, s- such transgressions, uh, abominations, so um, you wouldn't want to really be uh, connected to such a tribe. So they used their voice to receive, to accept upon themselves an oath not to marry from the tribe of Benjamin women. And the hands of Esav is explained by the Tiferet Sion commentator that they used the hands of, of Esav in a positive light. How was that? And here are his words. They used the hands of Esav to avenge what was done to this husband and wife and also not handing over the perpetrators of the evil that the community of Benjamin perpetrated. All these actions were done in order to return the honor to God's name. In other words, the 11 tribes, Israel used the hands of Esau for positive action. The hands of Esau are not something negative. It depends what the situation is. Uh, I remember many, many years ago, I heard from Shlomo Karlbach, he said an amazing line that uh, the, the job of the Jewish people is not only to use the voice of Jacob, but also to, uh, to take the hands of Esav and use them in a positive manner, which means there are wars that are negative wars, and there are wars that are milchemet uh, mitzvah. They are, they are wars that we are commanded to go out. They are a commandment. So it's a positive. So that's exactly what happened o- over here. So we see once again, this use of force of a war against the tribe of Benjamin is looked in a positive light. Number four, we have Rabbeinu Yona, who lived in 1235 in his famous work, Shari Tshuva. He writes the following, Shari Tshuva, the third gate, uh, 59. Those that do not protest against evil and those, ne- those that perpetrate evil transgress a negative commandment in the Torah. Lo Do not allow them to continue sinning. That is why the prophet Hosea rebukes his generation for not being like those in the generation of the couple on the hilltop of Benjamin who went out to fight and eliminate the evil of the Benjamin tribe. That's an amazing statement from Rabbeinu Yona. Fourth, the Maharsha, Rabbi Shmuel Eliezer, Idols, 1555 to 1631, in his commentary on Gitin 6b, this war that Israel fought against Benjamin was an obligatory war. Milchemet mitzvah, amazing. Number five, Rabbi Yonatan Evshitz, 
1694 to 1764. My brothers, let us learn from the actions of the 11 tribes to organize immediately to eradicate evil within our midst, even though, according to some opinion, this woman was not considered to be the man's wife. She was like uh, somebody he was living with. Even so, they went out and battled to eliminate the evil that was perpetrated against this woman. Unfortunately, in our times, we're talking about the late uh, 1600s, early 1700s, we do not show any zealousness for God's name and his Torah. Therefore, listen to these words, they should ring loudly in our ears. Therefore, God does not go out to fight for our honor. Because we do not go out to fight for God's honor, God does not go out to fight for the honor of the Jewish people. The Khatam Sofer, 1762 to 1839, in his commentary on the Tractate of Megillah, page uh, 82 in the Khatam Sofer. There's an interesting discussion between Rabbi uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his students. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai asked his students, why do you think that the Jewish people were almost annihilated in the times of Purim? And folks, we're one month before Purim. So this is, this is, uh, this is really close to our hearts. <clears throat> the students answered that the reason why the Jewish people were almost annihilated was due to the fact that they... Uh, participated in a party thrown by Achashverosh, which uh, it was a party to mark the end of the Jewish temple being rebuilt. Uh, and the Jewish people participated, 18,500 Jews participated in this party for their downfall. That's pretty, uh, pretty disgusting. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he asked in return, well, if that's the case, if the reason why the Jewish people all, almost were annihilated by Haman, but that doesn't make sense, your answer, because it should have been only the people that lived in the community, in the city of Shushan. Those were the people that participated in the festive meal thrown by Hashverosh for the fact that he believed that no longer 70 years had passed and that the temple would not be rebuilt. So 18,500 people that participated in the party, they were from the city of Shushan. They should be punished. Not the entire Jewish people who lived in all the 127 vicinities, uh, areas of Achashverosh, the king Achashverosh. And then there's no response by the students. The Khatam Sofer, I'm not going to get into it right now, but he gets into it and he proves that because of the fact that the students didn't respond, that doesn't mean that uh, there is not a true response. It just means they did not have a response. But it doesn't mean what they answered, that the fact that the Jewish people, the sin that led to the anni a possible annihilation of the Jewish people was the fact that they participated in their own downfall of this celebration, this party festival. That does not mean it was, there's not an answer to that. And that could definitely be the reason why all of the Jewish people at that time almost suffered an annihilation. Listen to what he said. Because of the fact that it's true, 18,500 people, they were from the city of Shushan, but every Jew has a has a responsibility, an obligation to protest. And therefore, we see that the Jewish people kept silent. They were not like the righteous people at the hilltop of Benjamin in the time of the, in the, time of the judges. That is amazing. The Khatam Sofer is giving them a thumbs up in what they did, that they responded to eradicate evil. The same should have been, there was no protest heard that the Jews of Shushan participated in this disgusting uh, party for the Jews' downfall. So we see once again, this is all in a positive light. Moving right along. 
the great book Chachmat Umusar, written by Rabbi Simcha Zisol of Kelm in 1824. Here's a summary of his words. Has there ever been a greater sanctification of God's name? All of Israel go up to fight Benjamin because of one woman. Notice how much the people of Israel despise corrupt behavior. Look how many people spent money, put money into a war effort, left all their daily occupations, their families, their wife, their kids, their occupation for this war. This is an amazing generation. Even so, despite their efforts, 22,000 of them fell in the first battle. This did not halt their efforts. Think of what would have happened if this happened to us, what would our response be? Uh, says Rav Simcha Zissel. Our response would be, wow, what a waste of time and effort doing God's will. Look, we tried to do God's will and, you know, look what happened to us. It all backfired in our face. No, they didn't say that. They did not complain. They did not bicker. They did not cry. They went out again. Next time, 18 more thousand Jews of uh, Jews were, were killed. Uh, the rabbi says, if this would happen to us in our days, we would deny the existence of God. Where is God? We're trying to do such an uplifting, such a beautiful act to uh, eliminate this evil tribe of, of Benjamin. We're out there fighting the good fight. And this is... This is your response, God? Throw it all away. Throw the religion away. Throw God away. That's what our response would be. But they, not in that generation, they looked at themselves and said, it must be we fell because of our sins. Because of our sins. They linked their 40,000 falling of theirs, two battles lost. They did not link it to God poor judgment, God forbid, but to their fault, to their shortcomings, not God's shortcoming. Beautiful. Last but not least, Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Glick lived in the 1800s. He has three-volume commentary on the Talmud. He writes the, the following. The tribes of Israel, the 11 tribes, were busy performing the mitzvah of removing evil from their midst. So once again, all thumbs up what, the, what Israel did, their fight against Benjamin. We see a tremendous positive reaction from a eight or nine commentators. Those of us out there might say, listen, Yehuda, wasn't Nachmanides with an N against this civil war. So let's get, let's get straight. Uh, Nachmanides did not use this term that he was against the fact that there was a civil war going on. Let's look at what he actually said. He looks at the fact that there were four transgressions here. Number one, the Jewish people fell because of the fact that they were not zealous when it came to the idol of uh, idol worshiping of Micha. Number two, they had trust in their own might and not in God. Three, Benjamin, according to Jewish law, according to Nachmanides' take, Jewish law obligates a tribe to judge their own tribe. Another tribe cannot come along and say, we're going to judge members of your tribe. Every tribe judges their own members. So that was the third uh, sin. Number four, the Jewish people uh, never asked, the 400,000 that went to fight against Benjamin never asked God if they should go out. They, uh, they asked um, who will go first. They never asked the question, should they go out? Uh, and therefore, that's why uh, they did not ask properly the question. However, nowhere does Nachmanides write that because of the fact they sinned, because of the fact that they fought a, uh, a civil war against Benjamin. 
never plays this card of unity. Uh, in parentheses, the, there are other Rishonim that totally disagree with Nachmanides. That is, of course, the Abar Vanel in the year 1480, pages on the, uh, his commentary on the judges, pages 155 to 156, and also in Spain in the 1400s, <coughs> the Akedad Yitzchak book by Rav Yitzchak Arama. He also disagrees with Nachmanides, but once again, Nachmanides never came out against the fact that they, the Jewish people attacked the tribe of Benjamin. Now we come to uh, come close to our summary. Sam Derech, the head of the yeshiva, Rabbi Simcha Zissel Broida, he lived uh, from 1912 to 2000. He was the head of the seminary of Hebron, not the city of Hebron, Hebron in Jerusalem. He was also a, a Dayan, a judge in the uh, religious Supreme Court in Israel. He has a six volume commentary on Nachmanides. Listen to what he says, listen to his words. We have a fundamental lesson. Though there may be, there may be terrible, corruptive, cruel behavior between people, these are pale in comparison to a lack of respect to God, lack of belief in God, or denial of God. This we learn from the story of the couple on the hilltop of Benjamin. Though they went out to war to fight against a despicable and horrific act of Benjamin, instead of being rewarded for their self-sacrifice and dedication to justice against, against that travesty, they were punished by death of tens of thousands since they did not protest against the idol of Micha, a crime against God. Go over those words, put on the rewind button, listen to them again. They're really, really amazing. I'll just say one sentence of his again. Though we might see terrible, corruptive, cruel behavior between human beings, these are pale in comparison to lack of respect against God, etc. Next, that's the first concept. We have to be zealous for God's honor. That takes precedence over being zealous for between human beings. Number two, foundation, cornerstone, the Bear Moshe on prophets. That was Rabbi Yechiel Epstein, otherwise known as the Rebbe of Azorov. He passed away 50 years ago. Listen to this, it's really amazing. After the tragic incident in Benjamin, the Jews gathered in a place called Mitzpeh, lookout site. There, they accepted upon themselves two oaths regarding, uh, regarding the actions of the tribe of Benjamin against this couple on the hilltop. Number one, anyone who did not participate in this community gathering uh, at the place called Mitzpeh would be killed. Number two, um, at this community gathering where all of the Jewish people met together, they vowed not to marry with in the tribe of Benjamin. As the battle uh, began and continued, it was noticed it was taken into account as the battle was taking place. All of a sudden, it dawned on them. They realized, hey, there was a group of people that did not appear, that were not present in this community gathering to decide what to, decide what to do against the transgression 
and disgusting behavior of Benjamin. That was a community called, uh, a community in a place called Yavesh Gilad. Israel sends 12,000 soldiers to the community of Yavesh Gilad to do battle against them. The obvious question that the Be'er Moshe asks is, why didn't the people of Yavesh Gilad come to this community meeting and participate in the elimination of, of evil against Benjamin? And he brings down an amazing idea. We must carve these words on our hearts. I summarized the Bear Moshe, page 251, Judges. Why didn't the people of Yavesh Gilad join the battle against Benjamin? It's not that they were against fighting against the evildoers. Rather, since they knew that the Jews had not protested when it came to a transgression against God, i.e., the idol of Micha, this would lead to a disastrous boomerang against Israel. And the fact is that that's exactly what happened. 40,000 Jews fell. If that ain't a boomerang, I don't know what it is. 40,000 Jews fell. Why? Because they didn't have the same zealousness when it came to uh, transgressions against God. So therefore, they had good intentions. The people of Yavesh Gilad, they were afraid that if they participated in the battle, the battle was a battle of good. It was the proper thing to do. However, because of the fact that the Jewish people had under their wing, so to speak, the transgression of not going out and eradicating, eliminating the idol worshiping of Micha. Therefore, it's going to make things worse. Against, it would be a boomerang against the Jewish people. It will make things worse. That was the reason why. Not that they had any sentiment towards uh, the people of Benjamin or any type of sympathy for their actions. Of course not. On the other hand, the Jewish people felt the Jewish people's response to Yavesh Gilad was, listen, God cares more about the honor of the Jewish people than his own honor. And therefore, we're going to go out and do battle. Remember those words, we're going to come to that subject. What is more dear, the Jewish people or righteous people's honor or God's honor? Remember those words. We will come to it in a few minutes. Anyways, the end, the conclusion of the Ber Moshe. Amazing. <clears throat> Though the inhabitants of Yavesh Gilad did not want to ignite prosecution against the Jewish people, they had good intentions. They had a tremendous, uh, they had a tremendous idea that this was going to uh, be a boomerang, and it really was a boomerang. Even so, they were punished. They were killed because of the fact that this was a mistake. They should have gone out and fought against the evil of the tribe of Benjamin. Honor of God versus honor of man. Here we go. Listen closely, dear friends. The original source of this conflict, what's more important when there's a contradiction, what do we, uh, what do, we do? The original source of this argument can be found in the Tractate of Nedarim, page 39, side B. The sun and the moon, so to speak, 
pun intended, came to God and said, listen, if you do not show the entire Jewish community that Moses is correct in his dispute with Korach and his uh, ilk, we will refuse to go out and shine our light during the day, sun, night, moon. So we see very clearly the sun and the moon are coming to honor Moses. They are demanding to God that God show everyone, it should be clear to everyone that Moses is truth and all others that are disagreeing with Moses are false. God says, so to speak, to the sun and the moon, condemns, condemns them. When it came to shining your light day in and day out, when people are worshiping all over the world the sun and the moon, people throughout history worship the sun and or the moon. You had no problem. God is telling the moon and the sun, all of a sudden, one day you wake up, when it comes to the honor of human beings, the honor of Moses, good morning, where have you been all these years? Every day you go out and you shine your light and there are people that are prostrating themselves, bowing down, believing in the powers of the sun or the powers of the moon or both. And you have no problem shining your light even though you are causing a lack of honor towards God. Instead of worshiping God, they're worshiping the sun and the moon. So that is the original concept. So we see very clearly here that God rebukes the sun and the moon for, on one hand, caring about the honor of Moses, on the other hand, not caring about the honor of God. So we, we learn from this, number one, that a person has to be balanced. Just like the story of the Jewish people fighting against Benjamin, there has to be a balance. We, a Jew stands up, human beings stand up on two legs. One leg is to be zealous for the honor of Israel, and number two, to be zealous to the honor uh, of God. That's lesson number one. Number two, the commentator in Eliyahu, that was Rabbi Eliyahu Sheik, 1808 to 1874. He uh, comments on this Talmud, once again, Nidarim 39b. He brings down another tractate, Nidarim 8a, and it says the following. In the end of days, God will punish, God, God will bring out the sun to cure the righteous and punish the wicked. In the end of days, this is an amazing concept itself. We should give a class on this. If we, uh, if we are following what is going on with the sun the, over the last uh, you know, decade or so, what is going on with the sun? That is an amazing, we see something is, a, is happening here. And we see the words of, the prophetic words of our Talmud that really something is going to happen. In the end of days, something big is going to happen with the sun in order to punish the wicked and to cure the righteous. So, Rabbi Eliyahu Sheik explains the following. At the end of days, God will bring out the sun to cure the righteous and punish the wicked. This will be the final repentance of the sun who will fix its sin of shining and giving light and life to the wicked who denied God. The honor of God's, the honor of God will be restored. This is an amazing lesson. God rebuked the sun and the moon when they came out 
for the honor of Moses. And God told him, where have you been all these years? Thousands of years before Moses existed. People were worshiping the sun and the moon and you still went out and you still shone even though they weren't worshiping God. This was a, so to speak, a slap in the face to God. Where were you? Nowhere to be found. So therefore, the sun and the moon, they have to repent. How is their repentance? In the end of days, they will go out and they will redeem the honor of God. How will they redeem the honor of God? They will redeem the honor of God by punishing the wicked. By punishing the wicked. The sun and the moon, they had a, they had a zealousness for the honor of human beings, of honor of people. In the end of days, they will correct instead of honor of God. In the end of days, they will correct that and they, in order to honor God, they will punish with the sun, they will punish the wicked. I thought humbly that this is really an amazing idea. It could have just said that the sun will punish the wicked. We could understand that would be a tremendous repentance for what happened in the past history. However, it also says that it will cure the righteous. And I think that is exactly, we said a human being stands on two legs, a Jew stands on two legs, that the two legs is that the son will demonstrate a zealousness for God, the honor of God by punishing the wicked, and also a zealousness for the love of human beings by curing the righteous. So it's solid foundation. <clears throat> Last question, which is connected to this. Don't our sages in Yalkut Shimoni, Melachim, uh, Kings 1, 201, chapter 201, doesn't it teach us that God is more scrupulous with the honor of the righteous than his own honor? It seems like, what's going on? It seems like the honor of the righteous people, of human beings, is more important to God than his own honor. Answer number one. So to speak, in God's uh, tefillin, it says, who are like the people of Israel? Uh, in Israel's, the parchments on Israel's, in Israel's uh, tefillin, it's a really hard English word, so I'm going <coughs> to, I'm not going to be embarrassed and try to say it. Philanth something. It says in our tefillin, Hero Israel, God is one. So we see very clear that there is a two-way street. God cares about the honor of Israel. That's why in his parchments, so to speak, in his tefillin, so to speak, it says, who are like the people of Israel? On the other hand, our obligation is crying out, Hero Israel, God is one. That is our our. Our mission is to be zealous for God's honor, and God uh, honors the Jewish people. Everyone has their own job. For example, another example of this, God tells Moses, go out to tell the Jewish people to avenge what was done to the people of Israel, take vengeance against the people of Midian. 24,000 Jews fell in a battle against Midian due to uh, immodest behavior, sexual behavior. <clears throat> Moses turns to the Jewish people and he changes God's words around. Amazing. He says, let us go out to avenge what happened to the uh, dishonor of God. So once again, this is exactly what we're talking about. Everyone has their job. You can't get into other people's faces. Don't take other people's job. Everyone has their job. So, you know, like we have Elchanan here, his job, he's, doing, he's our cameraman. He's doing a great job. My job here is to speak. I'm not telling him, can you turn this over here? I'm not giving him suggestions. He knows his job. He's doing his, what he has to do. I'm doing what I'm trying to do. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this also is a beautiful lesson in life with husband and wife. A husband should always concentrate on what could make my wife happy? 
not thinking of himself. A wife should always concentrate, what can I do to make my husband happy? If everyone, if the husband is concentrating on what he could do for his wife, if the wife is concentrating on what she could do for her husband, that is a beautiful marriage. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Everyone has their, the Jewish people have to be zealous for God's honor. God is zealous for the Jewish people's honors, not mixing up. In the book, Chidushe Rabbeinu Moshe Me'umaran, on the tractate of Nidarim, page 39. Hashem, so to speak, tells the sun and the moon, my honor I can forgo. However, your job is to be zealous for my name. This idea is brought down also in a book called Vayomer Yitzchak on page 50, also on the track date of Nidarim 39a. The mistake of the sun and the moon was that they understood this concept that for God, the honor of the righteous takes precedence over his. They were mistaken that this is, their mistake was that this is God for God to decide. God decides when and where he will be zealous for the honor of I, for the honor of Israel over his honor. It is not our job to decide when and where uh, we're going to be more scrupulous in the honor of Israel. That was the mistake. Yes, it is true that there are times that God is more scrupulous for the honor of the Jewish people over his honor. That does not allow us to play God. Amazing. It says in the Breshit Rabbah, it says that God wanted to make the forefather of the Jewish people, Shem, the son of Noah, one of the sons of Noah. However, when Shem, uh, who was called also Malkitzedek, when he meets up with Abraham after the victory of Abraham over the, uh, over the four kings, the king comes out and he praises Abraham and then he praises God. God says because of the fact that you praised a human being before you praised God, you will not be the forefather of the Jewish people. Instead, it will be Abraham. This is exactly the idea. God decides in which cases his honor is put on the side for the sake of the honor of the Jewish people, which comes first. But not for us to honor uh, a human being before honoring God. We have to have our priorities set, honoring God, honoring human beings. So, in conclusion, unity amongst Jews is definitely of the uttermost importance. No denial of that. However, not unity at all cost. Unity during the generation of the tower did not save them. Their unity was frowned upon. They were dispersed. God looked at their unity and said, you're being dispersed. Not only that, our sages tell us at the beginning of Psikta Rabati, it says very clearly that in the time of uh, the unity that was uh, present during the generation of the Tower of Babel caused the Divine Presence to remove itself one, so to speak, level from the world. So that was a tremendous um, destruction for the entire world. Um, unity, yes. Unity around Mount Sinai. Unity around God's commandments. Unity uh, around uh, the Torah, yes. Unity around the temple, yes, of course. Uh, unity in belief in God, for sure. Unity for the sake of unity, against God, against the Torah, against commandments, 
against God's land? A loud N-O, no. Dearest friends, in the last four months, we've seen beautiful, four and a half months, almost five, we've seen tremendous, beautiful unity within the Jewish people. Amazing, we could talk for days. Uh, all over the world, Jewish people awakening and tremendous amount of unity, beautiful. Uh, Jews embracing each other. However, the Jewish people went and fought this battle against, against these Nazi Arabs. It was the right thing to do, 100%, 100 million percent. It's a beautiful thing that we did. We became, we united for it. It is the right thing to do. However, our biggest danger facing the Jewish people is the day after the day after the war in Gaza, when we will be faced once again with challenges, will we stand up for God's honor the way that we united to fight against the evil forces of the Arab Nazis? Will we unite to fight against all types of decrees against Torah, commandments, and the land of Israel? That is the most frightening thought in my book in my book this is the question we should all be asking us we did the right thing we did the proper thing we've given our lives too many Jews have lost their lives for this mission the day after the war in Gaza all projectors will be on the question will we have the same unity zealousness to fight against Jewish decrees, against Torah, against commandments, against the land of Israel, against God. That is a frightening question to contemplate.